Today we have a crazy story of revenge against an evil best friend. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, I tattled like a snake because sometimes blood isn't so thick. When people say blood is thicker than water, I can bet that they've never met a family like mine. My family was picture perfect, and I mean that in every way the phrase has been used in time past. But what was beneath the covering of that perfect look was way more disturbing than anybody could imagine. In truth, I should not be telling this story to anyone. But what else have I got to lose anyway? I've lost my job, family, and the one person that truly cared about me. And to be fair, I am on the brink of losing my sanity, but that's fine. I'm not going down alone. At least I'll have my family with me. We would all go down that rabbit hole that stinks of betrayal and deceit. I never imagined that beneath the serene facade of our suburban home lay a web of lies and deception that would shatter my world. My name is Michael and this is the story of how I stumbled upon a long buried secret that exposed my mother Janice for the betrayer she truly was. It all began innocently enough, with a harmless search in the attic for some old family memorabilia. Amidst all the dusty boxes and forgotten belongings, I came across this weathered envelope that piqued my curiosity. I knew I'd never come across this envelope before, and if I remembered correctly, I'd helped Ma pack the contents of this particular box. So conventionally, I should not see anything strange inside the box. However, inside it, I found something more unfamiliar. A collection of yellowed letters, photographs, and a side of my mother that I'd never come across before. The first letter was dated years ago, addressed to Janice, and signed by a name I did not recognize. The words on the page hint at a clandestine relationship and the consequences of their actions. As I read on, the truth slowly unfolded before my eyes like a dark and twisted tale. Janice Anderson, who I refuse to believe is the same woman that raised me nothing shy of 19 years, a woman whose facade of charisma masked a labyrinth of deceit and betrayal, was a prominent figure in the suburban town we called home. To the outside world, she was an accomplished finance professional, a loving mother, and a pillar of the community. However, beneath the surface of her seemingly perfect life lay a complex and shadowy past. And I will learn the truth first from the letters. As I recount this story, I wondered what her ploy was, and why she never thought to destroy any evidence that could lead to the discovery of the life she once lived. Was she expecting me to find the truth someday? Or did she just believe that I would never be smart enough to figure it all out? But she was wrong. Very. Janice's ambition was evident from a young age. She was determined to rise above her modest beginnings and make her mark in the world. As she entered adulthood, her drive led her to pursue a career in finance, where she showcased exceptional skills in handling numbers and making calculated decisions. During her ascent in the financial world, Janice encountered influential individuals who would play pivotal roles in her transformation. She was welcomed into a circle of power and privilege, rubbing shoulders with the town's elite. These connections opened doors for her, propelling her career to new heights. In the early stages of her success, Janice made her mark by leveraging her charisma and charm to forge alliances. She was a master at reading people. She still is to a large extent, sensing their vulnerabilities and using them to her advantage. Many admired her business acumen, but just a few saw the ruthless tactics she employed to climb the corporate ladder. It was this ambition that led Janice to uncover a secret that could have potentially destroyed the reputation of one of the town's most influential figures. The truth gave her leverage over powerful individuals, which she shamelessly wielded for her own gain. If you know who paraded herself to be my mother now, you would predict her next line of action was to expose the evil, right? Well, this is because, like me, we did not both know the real Janice. Instead of exposing the truth, Janice made a fateful decision that would forever alter the lives of those involved. She chose to use the knowledge to secure favors, cement alliances, and advance her career. And if I read through those letters correctly, this was at a point where she began trading the truth for power and she set herself on a path that would lead to the eventual unraveling of her carefully constructed life of lies. As she became entangled in a web of deceit, she found herself making deals with unsavory characters, whose motives were far from honorable. She underestimated the consequences of her actions, believing that she could maintain control of the situation, but the web of deception she spun would soon ensnare her as well. I like to believe that she was never this bad, 
I like to believe that all I read was a lie, but it wasn't. The woman I knew was false, a figment of my imagination, and as I sat in the dim light that day processing all I had read, I began to recount events that might have shown the lapses in her acts. One of those nights in her greed for a seat at the table, fueled by her thirst for control and power, Janice made a critical mistake that reverberated through the lives of many. She betrayed the trust of close friends, implicating them in a fraudulent scheme that was designed to protect her own interests. Innocent lives were upturned, relationships shattered, and the tranquility of the suburban town was forever shattered. In the aftermath of her actions, Janice's world began to crumble. The consequences of her deceit weighed heavily on her conscience, and she struggled to maintain the facade that she had so carefully crafted. People began to question her integrity, and the once admired figure found herself ostracized and isolated. As the truth slowly emerged, families affected by Janice's actions sought justice and closure. The pain she caused was immeasurable, and forgiveness seemed like an insurmountable task for those she had wronged. She had shattered their trust, and she felt it could never be fully repaired. My mind struggled to comprehend the incongruity between the loving mother I had known and this woman who had caused such devastation. The memories of laughter and warmth we shared now clashed with the revelations of her past actions. I couldn't help but wonder if the affection she had shown me had been a facade all along. During my quest for truth, I reached out to old family friends and acquaintances seeking to understand the events that had unfolded in the past. Each conversation peeled back another layer of deception, revealing a side of Janice I had never fathomed. The people who had once admired and respected her now spoke of her with a mix of pity and disdain. I tried to make sure she would not see me coming from the shadows. I wasn't sure what she would do to keep her past a secret if she found out I'd been poking around, but that was not all. There was one last piece of paper, one letter that seemed different from the rest in the pile that I found. I couldn't understand what I read, but I knew I had to find out. In the dark room where I sat with the letter, I clutched the letter tightly in my hand, my heart pounding in anticipation and dread. The words etched on the paper had sent shivers down my spine, revealing a dark secret that challenged everything I thought I knew about my mother. So I decided to follow the address on the letter hoping to find answers that had remained hidden for far too long. But now, I wish I didn't. At least, I wouldn't hurt so much. The letter was addressed to a prison, and from googling the location, I realized that it would take me 12 hours on the road to get there, but if that was the price I had to pay to understand everything, I was willing to do so. As I approached the prison, a mix of fear and curiosity gripped me. I could not have anticipated what awaited me within those cold steel walls. My mind raced with questions as I stepped into the visitation area, searching for a man who had written the blackmail letter. Finally, my eyes met the gaze of a weathered man seated across the table. His eyes held a glimmer of cunning knowledge, the weight of his own sins evident on his face. His face looked awfully familiar, like I knew him or I'd seen him before. Yet, I struggled to narrow down where I'd seen him. The first words that would proceed from his mouth were that I looked just like my grandfather when he was in his 20s. Now, this got my attention immediately, because as far as I know, I've never met my grandfather. So, why would a stranger in prison miles from where I've been all my life know I looked like my grandfather? I introduced myself, and he nodded knowingly, as though he was acknowledging that he knew what had let me come to him. The man's name was Robert, and as he spoke, the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. He revealed that my mother was in fact the mastermind behind how he landed in prison with a 20-year sentence from the judge. He had once been one of her closest confidants, but his knowledge of her nefarious actions made him a threat. That's when she decided to take drastic measures. In a voice tinged with bitterness, Robert recounted the tragic accident that had claimed the life of my true mother, Janice's best friend, and his wife. It had been a fateful night, and the events that unfolded were far from accidental. My mother's web of deceit had spun out of control. The paper trail for embezzlement was being linked back to her department, but she was smart enough to divert the attention to him since they worked in the same corporation then. Robert claims he has no proof of how his wife died, but he swore that it was the people who thought he had wronged them that decided to take it out on him through his wife. 
It meant one thing. It was my mother's fault. Tears welled up in my eyes as I learned the truth about my identity. I wasn't Janice's biological child. I was the child of the close pal she had betrayed. The weight of this revelation threatened to crush me, and I struggled to come to terms with the lies that had been woven around me my entire life. As I listened to Robert's account, I saw the complexity of human nature unravel before me. My mother, driven by ambition and the desire to protect her carefully curated life, had sacrificed the well-being of others. Her thirst for power and control had led her down a path of deceit and betrayal. But there was one thing I could not understand. Why did Robert not fight against it? Why did he leave her for so long? What was the point of the blackmail letter he sent to her seven years ago? I left the prison that day with my mind a whirlwind of emotions. I felt anger towards my mother for the web of lies she had spun around me. I felt grief for the mother I'd lost and confusion about my place in this tangled narrative. I thought I would get the whole truth, but I didn't. Not from Robert, at least. I knew that I had to confront her. It was only her that could set me free from the chains of deception that had kept me bound to her for years, and this was exactly what I did. As I stood before my mother, clutching the pile of incriminating letters, My heart was heavy with both determination and sorrow. I had hoped that confronting her with the truth would elicit remorse or even a glimmer of acknowledgement, but instead she chose to feign ignorance. The weight of her deception crushed me and I knew that justice demanded action. In the days that followed, I made the difficult decision to leave home and report my mother's crimes to the authorities. Armed with the evidence I'd uncovered, I approached the police to report the stolen identity and the tangled web of deceit that had ensnared us for far too long. The officers, initially skeptical of my story, eventually decided to delve deeper into the matter, and as the truth began to surface, the police uncovered the full extent of my mother's actions. The evidence was irrefutable, and the wheels of justice were set into motion. The woman, who had once been a prominent figure in the community, was now exposed for the ruthless deceiver she truly was. It felt like a form of revenge, but deep down, I knew that justice needed to be served. The pain she had caused, the lives she had shattered, demanded accountability. However, justice came at a steep cost, one that I could never have foreseen. My baby sister, just 14 years old, was caught in the crossfire of our mother's web of lies. With my mother's arrest, my sister was thrust into the system, a victim of circumstances she could not comprehend. It broke my heart to see her suffer, and I desperately wanted to shield her from the pain. I tried to explain the situation to my sister, to make her understand that the actions I'd taken were necessary for justice to prevail. But how could I expect her to grasp the complexities of her mother's deception at such a tender age? To her, I was tearing our family apart, and the resentment she felt towards me was palpable. I longed to tell her the whole truth, to reveal the depths of our mother's betrayal, but I knew that she wasn't ready to bear that burden. In pursuing justice for the victims of my mother's deception, I had unwittingly become the catalyst for our family's unraveling. As I navigated through the aftermath, I found solace in knowing that justice had been served, and that the victims of my mother's deceit had found some measure of relief, but I still wonder what my father would say if he could see me now. Would he have known about her secrets, or had he been blissfully unaware just like the rest of us? Would he understand the choices I had made, the sacrifices I had endured, or would he be disappointed that the family he had loved had been torn apart by the very person he trusted most? You would like to think that they would understand what OP did, and understand that In OP's situation, having that feeling and that conviction to serve justice here and make things right is too important than trying to cover it all up just for the sake of keeping your family together. I mean, in OP's situation, if it bothers you that badly, how are you going to even go back to just having a family like that? You can't just learn some crazy dark truths about your own mom and then just pretend it didn't happen. Huh, that was a funny piece of fiction I read there. It's so crazy to stumble upon mom's creative writing days. Our next story is how I got my revenge on my evil best friend. They say you've gone mad when you start to think about ending someone. So I knew I'd lost all my sanity when I realized how badly I wanted to end Alicia 
for what she'd done to me. Alicia and I had been besties since kindergarten. She had a bubbly personality even then. I can clearly remember the day she bounced over to my table in the lunchroom, her golden curls jumping all over her head. She'd sat across me and stared me dead in the eyes. Hi, I'm Alicia, she said with that serious look on her face. We're both in Miss Julie's class. You may have seen me. I sit in the front row beside Rob, the boy who's always farting. I've seen you. You sit beside Anna. And you're always doodling in your notebook. Let's be friends. I smiled at her. Do you always talk like that? Like what? She'd asked, clearly puzzled. Without taking a breath or bothering to pause. She smiled proudly. I have an impressive pair of lungs, I've been told. Now, answer my initial question. I shook my head laughing. Okay, Alicia, sure, I'd like to be your friend. We walked back to class together that day, and since then, we became inseparable. At least, we were inseparable. My childhood was spent sharing crisps with her, listening to her complaints about Rob's ceaseless farting. They remained seat partners for almost three years, accompanying her to the park and stealing my older sister's makeup to try on with her in the bathroom. As we grew into teenagers, we were always in each other's company. We convinced our parents to always let us have sleepovers. We shared crushes on the cute boys in the year above us. We gossiped about the seniors who cut their uniform skirts so short, even though we did the same in our final year. We were the first people to know when we both got our periods. And when I got my first kiss from a dude called Pablo, she was the first person I called to rant about how anticlimactic it was to get kissed by a boy whose breath stink like onions. He just finished a Big Mac burger before the kiss. When we became 16, everyone that knew us concluded that we were twin sisters that had been separated at birth. I loved Alicia so dearly, and I'd like to believe she loved me too just not enough. Even as we grew into adults, we were thick as thieves. We met with each other practically every day, shared fashion advice, shared our struggles in the tough world, and even shared secrets, good ones and nasty ones, without judging each other. I trusted her much more than I ever trusted my sister. As the years rolled by, we were separated by distance. Alicia had to move to London to promote her journalism career, I had to stay in America with my family and my underpaying job in a law firm. We managed to stay in touch though. There were late night FaceTimes on the days we weren't wiped out from work. We tried to make sure we notified each other about the major changes in our lives. We even had virtual dates, but it wasn't the same. We missed each other terribly and I couldn't get rid of the sinking feeling that we were drifting apart. I dated Zach for two years when she notified me that she was transferring back to America. She'd gotten a promotion, and the headquarters happened to be in New York. I was so excited, I could barely contain the excitement in my voice as I told the news to my family. The best part? She was going to be sharing my apartment with me till she was able to get one of her own. The night before her arrival, I couldn't sleep. I'd thrown a huge surprise party for her at my place. I'd invited all of our old friends, I'd made sure everyone got her gifts, and on the massive cake was written in capital letters, WELCOME HOME. Everything seemed perfect, but for some reason, my heart was beating at an unusually fast rate. It got even faster the next day when we were 30 minutes away from her arrival. I told her I wouldn't be able to pick her up from the airport because I was stuck at work, so I'd given her directions to the apartment and told her I'd hidden a spare key in the potted plant outside the door. Nothing was out of place and I was sure she had no clue anything was going on, but I was still a bit anxious. What if we've drifted so far that we become strangers to each other? What if she hates living with me? What if she prefers her British friends to me? Were we still best friends? I swallowed hard and tried not to think the worst. All would be fine, I hoped. The air stood still as we heard her fumbling with the keys and opening the lock. It was as if everyone in the room had held their breath. As she stepped into the room, lights flooded the place and everyone screamed, Welcome back home! I stared at her from the back of the room. She looked different. She hadn't told me that she'd dyed her hair brown and had cut it short. We'd already put on our bonnets before most of our FaceTimes. She walked differently and she looked like she hit the gym every other day. But as our eyes met across the room, they looked exactly as I remember. And she smiled her wide, childish grin. We launched into each other's arms and all my fears were forgotten. It was still Alicia, and she was here in person and she looked amazing. 
We partied till late in the evening and caught up on a lot of drama that had been going on in our lives. We were cleaning up from the party when Zach finally arrived. Hey babe, he said, planting a kiss on my cheek. Sorry I couldn't leave the gallery early. You know how these collectors are. I sighed and dragged him over to Alicia. Alicia, I called. I'd like you to meet Zachary. He's an artist and the only person in the world that always ends up arriving after the party is over. She stared at me wide-eyed. You mean, Zach, like, your boyfriend? Yeah. She shook her head. You didn't tell me he was gorgeous. Zach started to cough and I couldn't hold in my laughter. Well, gorgeous Zachary, meet my also gorgeous best friend, Alicia. Nice to meet you, he said. Though I already feel like I know you, she talks about you all the time and it gets tiring. His voice reduced to a mock whisper as he said the last part. I playfully hit him on his torso and he pulled me in for a kiss. Alicia rolled her eyes. Um, too much PDA, people. Get a room. I laughed at her comment and left them to get to know each other. I wanted all the people I loved to love each other. A little while later, I felt a hand across my waist. I knew it was Zach. He helped me with the rest of the cleaning and rubbed my feet as I told him about my day. Alicia, on the other hand, was jet-lagged and jumped into bed before we were even half done cleaning. Won't it be weird for you having her here? I could see the worry in his eyes as he asked. Not at all, I answered. He smiled. I know you mean well and all, but you like your space, and you're kind of a neat freak. I whacked his head with a pillow. Who is a neat freak? He laughed and tickled me. You know what I mean. Fine, I sighed. I do understand what you're saying, but it's Alicia, and I'm willing to do anything for her. And I meant it. Being roommates with her wasn't bad. It was a lot of fun, and included a lot of weekend alcohol and sheet masks. Sometimes she'd be home before me and would have prepared our dinner or randomly show up with some delicious treat from work. It was only hard for me when I noticed her shoes under the bed or a pot in the dish rack or when she slept on my pillow. As Zachary said, I liked my space clean, but no matter how many times I tried to remind her, she seemed to forget one thing or the other. She became friends with Zach and I'd always include her in any date plans if she wasn't busy and we tried as much as possible not to make her feel like a third wheel. Then all of a sudden, they both started acting weird. At first, I didn't notice the slight changes in both of them when they were around each other, but they became more obvious. The controlled glances at each other now and then, the restraint in their tones now and then, and I refused to let myself suspect anything till I noticed how they avoided physical touch so carefully. It wasn't like that before, I was sure of it. Zach used to ruffle her hair whenever she beat me at chess, or she'd play choke him when he made dumb jokes. But now they were being way too careful. They'd keep a lot of distance between them when they were on the same chair, and they wouldn't as much as let their breaths come in contact with each other. And people only did that when they'd reached a level of intimacy they were trying to hide. I was extremely bothered, but I didn't want to make any dramatic decisions, just to be proved wrong. I didn't want to believe that what I was thinking was true, but the more I kept quiet, the worse things were getting. At some point, they both became almost unavailable to do anything with me. Alicia would be stuck at a work meeting, while Zach would coincidentally be occupied with some art exhibit or the other. At the same time, I tried to keep my tongue in my cheek, but it was too much to hold in. So I finally asked Alicia what was going on and why she never seemed to be around anymore. She told me it was because she'd met someone, and she liked him, but she didn't want to tell me about him yet, because she wasn't sure if it was serious or not. The relief that coursed through me was instantaneous. That was what was going on. I must have imagined everything I thought I saw. Alicia would never do that to me. Zach loved me. He wouldn't betray me either. Since I knew what was going on with Alicia, we seemed to have more time together. She was always on her phone texting Mark, the mystery guy, but she gave me enough details about him to make me love him for making her so happy. I teased her a lot though because she had this dreamy look in her eyes whenever she talked about him or when she texted him. I told her how I felt like Zach was getting tired of me, but she assured me that she'd never seen two people so in love. We were doing sheet masks and having a gab sesh one Saturday when Mark hit her up. It had to be him because her whole face lit up when she looked at her screen. I laughed. That mark, huh? She sighed. God, am I that obvious? 
We all know the answer, but I never replied to that question, because at that moment, the fire alarm sounded in our kitchen, which meant that the forgotten pancakes she was making must have been black as char. Just as she left for the kitchen, her screen flashed with a notification from Mark. Then she got three more messages from him in less than a minute. Alicia, I called. Mark must have something extremely important to say to you. But before she could get back to the room, he'd placed a FaceTime for her. Lo and behold, Mark's face didn't fit his name because his real name started with a Z and not an M. Right there on the screen, his profile picture was flashing at me, but the name on the screen was Zax. Desperate to be proved wrong, I accepted the call, and just as Alicia walked into the room, Zach's surprised face stared at me from the screen. I stared at her while Zach was muttering some excuse from the phone. How could you? I asked, expecting a full-blown apology, but she stared back at me coldly and told me that I didn't deserve him and that he had stopped loving me a long time ago, but he didn't want to leave me because I was too immature and he was scared to wreck me, so I should grow up and realize that I can't have the world at my fingertips. Dumbfounded and filled with raging emotions, I stumbled out the door into the nearest bar I could find. I couldn't breathe. This could not have been happening. I was probably dreaming, but I wasn't. By the time I returned to my apartment, she'd cleared out all her things and left a please don't contact me note on the kitchen table. As if I was ever going to contact her, I hated her. Men come and go, but friendships were supposed to last a lifetime. I would have been able to deal with Zach cheating with anybody else, but the fact that she could betray me like that broke me. I'd given her the best of my heart and she guiltlessly messed it up without a second thought. I was never going to let anyone get that close to me again. And she was going to pay very dearly for every tear I'd shed. A year later, I received their wedding invitation in my mail. And I couldn't believe that they'd handed me the opportunity to get my revenge on a platter of gold. I didn't feel sad that they were getting married. All I could feel was hate and anger. I felt mocked. But that was alright because soon, they'd be crying out in anger and embarrassment. The morning of the wedding, I dressed up in my best black gown with a black hat and dark makeup. When I walked into the church, everyone turned to look at me, but I didn't mind. That was exactly what I wanted. I kept my head low till the priest in charge of the ceremony asked if anyone had an objection. Then, I marched with my eyes fixed on the confused looking people to the front of the altar. I took the microphone from the priest and cleared my throat. Today, I'm dressed in black, I began. Not as a mistake, but as a symbol of mourning. I went on and told the whole church about how she'd betrayed me and stolen my boyfriend, but I didn't stop there. I revealed a very unforgivable secret about how Alicia had gotten pregnant when she was 20, and she left the baby outside of the orphanage. As I walked out of the church, I saw her parents getting up from their seats and leaving the church too. I looked back and saw her crying on the altar with a shocked looking Zach staring at her, but refusing to go close to her. I watched the tears fall for a minute and felt something close to happiness. Some days later, I heard that the marriage didn't take place. You know, usually it's just a formality thing when somebody says, speak now or forever hold your peace or whatnot. But usually most of those people don't have quite such a big bombshell to drop to just utterly ruin the wedding. OP just basically Oppenheimered the entire venue. It was like the collective three years of their seatmate Rob the farting classmate was unleashed in that venue and everybody just had to clear out. I mean, dirty laundry like that that was shared? That's one of those ones where you're in the pew, you put your hands up, you slap your lap, and you immediately go to get up like, I'm not getting involved in this. I don't want to be a part of this memory in therapy. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.